Welcome back y'all. In this video I'm going to be making copper 1 oxide also known as cuprous oxide. Copper in the 1 plus oxidation state is unusual as the 2 plus oxidation state is more common because copper 1 salts are sensitive to oxidation even by the oxygen in the air. I don't have any use for cuprous oxide at the moment but a viewer commented on a video in the past and asked me to make it so I figured why not. It should be pretty easy. Depending on the particle size, it can be anywhere between yellow and red. Using this procedure, it is a beautiful brick red. It's done by using a qualitative test in a quantitative way, which is a bit unorthodox. I'll make it by using failing solution consisting of copper 2 sulfate, potassium sodium tartrate, which I'll refer to from now on as Rochelle salt, sodium hydroxide, and sucrose, which I use cane sugar as a source of because it's almost pure sucrose. Failing solution is used to test for reducing sugars as the copper 2 tartrate complex formed upon mixing the salts, excluding the sugar, is an oxidizing agent, and cuprous oxide is formed when the sugar reduces the complex. No red precipitate means the sugar is non reducing. If the sugar is reducing, there's going to be a red precipitate formed. There are plenty of videos about failing solution, so if you're interested in it other than as a way to obtain cuprous oxide, this probably isn't the video for you. Sucrose itself isn't a reducing sugar, but it can be hydrolyzed by boiling it with failing solution, and the products, glucose and fructose, are reducing sugars. I could be wrong, maybe there's some weird complexation going on with the copper ions in solution, I don't know. A paper I found cites a 1941 paper that noted that sucrose is slowly, but steadily, hydrolyzed by strongly alkaline copper reagents and thus can produce a reducing effect on these agents. What I do know is that if glucose is used instead of sucrose in this same procedure, copper metal is produced, not cuprous oxide. The boiling of the solution is likely the reason for this, but it might also be the stoichiometry. I know that this happens because I was skeptical of the procedure using sucrose, a non-reducing sugar, so I tried it with glucose first and I got copper metal. I redid the whole thing using sucrose instead and got cuprous oxide. I omitted recording the remaking of the solution before the addition of sucrose because it's basically identical to what's shown in the first few clips. There is another unrelated method of producing cuprous oxide that I'm looking into but it involves pH control, which complicates things. That might take some trial and error and patience because I'm not sure how well my pH meter will work, but I'll find out. On to the video. Here are the reagents I used. The copper sulfate is the pentahydrate. First, I dissolve the copper sulfate in water, then add the Rochelle salt. The copper tartrate complex formed isn't very soluble at this pH, so it forms a flocculent precipitate. Adding the sodium hydroxide quickly causes it to dissolve, and the heat generated upon the dissolution helps since I'm about to boil it after adding the glucose. I love the color changes in making this solution, but it's too bad that after adding the sodium hydroxide, it is too dark to see just how rich the dark blue is. After I add the glucose, the solution very quickly changes color, even before heating it. I think this would work to form cuprous oxide if it wasn't heated, but I didn't try this because sucrose is so much cheaper and more readily available. After boiling for a few minutes, the color deepened and the copper colored rim around the top of the solution was my first hint that I messed up. Afterwards, I started to decant the solution from the copper and wash it with distilled water, something that was later proven a bit redundant because I ended up filtering the decanted solutions as well to recover the small amounts of copper that carried over in the decantations. I kept washing and decanting until the wash water was nearly neutral and clear. The procedure I base this on says to use a hardened filter paper, which I do have, but they're the 55 millimeter diameter ones and using such a large filter for such a small volume of solid seemed wasteful, so I used these glass microfiber filters with a Hirsch funnel instead, and it worked great. Hardened filter papers, generally made by acid treatment, have smaller pores than normal filter paper, and while they take longer to filter, they retain much finer precipitates. I ended up with 12.51 grams of copper powder, which is a 98.31% yield based on the starting copper sulfate.
and now for the way that it was supposed to be. The solution was prepared as before, and here's the sucrose I should have used in the first place. The solution reaches about 40 degrees when the sodium hydroxide is added, so when I add the sucrose, it does react slowly. I heated the solution to a boil, kept it there for maybe 15 minutes, and allowed it to cool as before. For whatever reason, the solution from the glucose run was very dark, but still orangish, and this solution from the sucrose run is clear. I'm not sure why. Maybe it has to do with some degree of reduction of species that are in the solution because the glucose would reduce it to a further degree than the sucrose would. This solution took a lot longer to filter than the glucose run, so I poured the supernatant liquid into a separatory funnel and matched the drip rate from it onto the funnel to the same drip rate of what was passing through the Hirsch funnel. In the end, I got 13.89 grams of cuprous oxide, which is a 96.95% yield based on the starting copper sulfate. I'm pretty happy with this yield. I did get a little sloppy when I was washing the precipitate of the cuprous oxide, and there are a few pictures of mechanical loss due to carelessness. I feel like it's probably closer to 98% would be the yield, roughly the same as I got of the copper metal. But in any case, when I realized that I most likely made copper metal, I tested it in a test tube by just dropping hydrochloric acid on it because copper does not react with hydrochloric acid, but cuprous oxide does. When nothing happened, I figured that I had made copper and not cuprous oxide, which is what prompted me to redo everything. So that's about all I've got. Thank you for watching. I hope the viewer that suggested I make this sees this video. Like, comment, and or subscribe if you want to. Let me know if you have any suggestions on video ideas. I'm open to most things, ideally organic synthesis related, but some simpler inorganic syntheses could be fun. And I'll see you in the next video.